my Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and in this video, I am doing a book versus movie comparison of a scene, but it also follows on the last two videos I did, which relate very strongly to the topic of magic in Middle Earth and what really is magic versus other things like technology or what Tolkien would call the art of the elves. And the reason is I have this theory about this particular scene, which is that there's not really a whole lot of magic that happens. And that's in very stark contrast to the movie, in which case there is very clear magic going on. And I think I've mentioned this before in a previous video I did about magic a long time ago, but here I really want to get into the details and dive into it and explain why I don't think there's much magic, but also explore just the differences in how this plays out in each version of the story, because the differences are very interesting, and they go to another issue, which is how the issue of Theoden's sickness, for lack of a better term, is being presented, what it means, and how its cure is affected, and what that has implications for in the rest of the story. So, without further ado, let's take a look at Gandalf and the Three Hunters meeting Theoden at Metaseld. First thing to note here is that the introduction to Metaseld is very different. Of course, in the movie, we get this idea that, you know, everybody's really depressed and everything, and Gimli says you'd find more cheer in a graveyard. Of course, they're all basically mourning the loss of Theodred, which is Theoden's only son, and so that's the reason. This isn't really played up so much in the book. At, at the arrival at Edoras, there's actually guards at the gate, not at the Metaseld itself, but at the gate of Edoras, and they have a conversation there, and they have to get allowed into Edoras in the first place. And then when they get to the, the door wards of Metaseld, Hama is the door ward, as he is in the movie, and he comes and basically greets them after the door wards themselves, the ones who are just kind of sitting there at each side, stand and given a, la a, not elaborate, but a very formal greeting in the tongue of the Rohirrim, and then Hama greets them in the common tongue, and there's a very, very formal kind of diplomatic exchange that goes on. And of course, then we get to the issue of the weapons. Now, the weapons is where things get a lot different in the two different versions of this scene, because in the movie, Hama basically says, you know, you have to leave your weapons, and everybody just starts unloading weapons, and then Gandalf, once everybody's done that, looks at him like, we're good now? And Hama said, your staff, gotta have that too. And ha Gandalf here, he does this thing where he's like, oh, you wouldn't part an old man from his walking stick, like, oh, the horror, how could you be so mean? This is not at all how it goes down in the book, and there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, there is no Onduril present in the movie, and that's the basis for a lot of the differences that happen in the book, because this gets a lot more drawn out, because a couple of people start handing over their weapons, and Aragorn just kind of like, mm, not so sure I want to do this, and he's <laughs> he basically says, it's not my will that anybody else should have, you know, handle my sword. And we get another exchange. Hama says, well, it's the will of Theoden. And we get all this about, well, I don't know why the will of Theoden should trump mine, the heir of Isildur. And, you know, Gandalf even at one point steps in and says, this is silly, but there's no point in fighting it. We're going to have to give up our weapons to get in. And even the master of a woodman's cot would have the right to tell you to take off your sword. Gandalf, I don't think, says that part. But, I mean, that's part of the conversation. And Aragorn then goes back to, well, I wouldn't care who it was, but if it was any sword other than Anduril. And so this goes on and on and on. And then finally Aragorn gives in, and he basically takes it himself, sets it against the wall, and says, don't anybody touch that. If anybody draws that sword but me, they die. And he, it's a lot more impressive in the book, of course. I'm paraphrasing very grossly, but Hama kind of steps back and he's like, it will be as you say. And then by this point, Gandalf has already given up Glamdring. Gimli chimes in and says, well, if Anduril will keep it company, then my axe has no problem. Uh, and then they're about to enter, and then the issue of the staff comes up. 
And rather than pulling the, oh, you wouldn't take my stick from me, I'm such an old man line, Gandalf kind of uses the same approach in the book, but he does it in a very different style because he says, this is foolish. If he's not even going to let me walk in with my prop for old age, then I'll just sit out here and wait till Theoden comes. Aragorn then, of course, has his turn to laugh and says, everybody has something that they're not willing to give up. Uh, but they carry on the conversation a little bit. And then Hama says, you know, it, it's the rule, but in a time of doubt, a man of judgment and character will trust his own wisdom. And I don't think any of you are enemies or mean any ill will. So I'll let you in. Whereas of course in the movie, Hama just kind of like looks at him like, "Mm," and, and lets him go in anyway. Now, In the movie, once they enter, Gandalf is very clearly not using the staff. In fact, if you look closely, you can see in the scene that even though he's kind of leaning on Aragorn for support, kind of pretending to anyway, he's holding his staff very... um, He's holding it at an angle such that the camera you angle only sees like the tip of it and... It's like you're looking along the length of the staff so that it's practically hidden. And the idea, I think, in the movie is that he's holding it specifically to disguise its presence from Wormtongue and or Theoden. And so that's the point there. Whereas in the book, it specifically says he actually leans on his staff as he goes. So there's a very major difference there, too. In one of them, Gandalf is actually being consistent with his own stated reason for not giving up the staff. So they get in, and we get a whole lot more differences that become much more relevant to the main point of this video. Now, when they enter, of course, the movie, we see a very, very old and decrepit Theoden. Whereas that's not so much the case in the book. The book, he's old, but he's not obviously decrepit in that same way. Here's the description we get in the book. Upon it sat a man so bent with age that he seemed almost a dwarf, but his white hair was long and thick and fell in great braids from beneath a thin golden circlet set upon his brow. In the center upon his forehead shone a single white diamond. His beard was laid like snow upon his knees, but his eyes still burned with a bright light, glinting as he gazed at the strangers. Now this is very different because in the movie, of course, Theoden doesn't have long white braided hair, nor does he have a beard laid out on his knees. His hair is actually mostly gone and very, very straggly, very pathetic, uh, which, of course, changes later when he's cured by Gandalf in the movie. That cure never has an effect on his physical appearance in the book, as far as we can tell, other than one thing, but that's not so clearly the cure. I'll get there. In the book, he clearly is old and he's bent with age but he's clearly still there mentally he's got that gleam in his eye he's you know he's not just something that grima uses as a puppet to get his message across really so there's a very different thing going on in the book versus the movie in the movie theoden well gandalf greets him and says the courtesy of your hall is somewhat lessened of late and then theoden says why should i welcome you gandalf stormcrow and then he looks to grima wormtongue like did i say that right and then grima carries on and says a just question my liege and goes on with his thing in the book it's very different theoden kind of immediately starts the conversation and rolls into things and he stands when he does it so he's clearly not decrepit in the same way. And when he stands, it becomes clear that even though he's bent with age, he's actually fairly tall, or would be if he was not so bent with age. Theoden gets into the issue of, you know, why Gandalf is here and mentions that he was not so unhappy when Shadowfax came back, but Gandalf didn't, but he is kind of peeved that Shadowfax now lets no man handle him. Or maybe it was Wormtongue that mentions that later. But at any rate, he then, you know, says... Grima, I think, takes up the conversation a bit and says, you know, you've shown up many times and it's always with bad news. And Gandalf kind of makes the retort that there's two kinds of people with bad news. One who bring the bad news but offer help. And then there's people who bring the bad news because they are the bad news. And Wormtongue comes back with, well, there's a third kind, the kind that pick bones after the fact. And he gets to the idea of, what do you bring to aid us now? Do you bring swords, spears? All I see is three beggars and you the most beggar-like of the four. 
And Gandalf, this is where in the book, Gandalf actually mentions the courtesy element. He doesn't do it immediately as he does in the movie, which in the movie, therefore, makes it seem like he's referring to having to give up the weapons and all this other stuff. Instead, he brings it up here by saying, haven't you been told the names of your guests? These people are worth, you know, many, many, you know, renowned men. Uh, and so, and he, I think he even says their weapons are worth many renowned men. And so he's he's criticizing the lack of courtesy in that they had to announce themselves, and yet apparently they were not announced, because Grima is saying, what are you bringing here except a bunch of beggars? And Wormtongue probably did know who they were, or Theoden at least, because they probably were announced, but Wormtongue, of course, is playing it down, not really understanding who they truly are. So there's a very different dynamic there. There's a bit of there's a more diplomatic give and take in the book than there is in the movie. And in the movie, it's a lot more just Grima carrying the conversation and just putting them down without any real subtlety in the exchange. And then, of course, in the movie, what we get is after Grima has had his say, Gandalf pipes in and just says, you know, keep silent, keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. I haven't come, you know, from fire and death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm and then he shows him his staff and worm tongues all like i told you to take his staff and then we get a fight scene in the middle of theoden's hall there is no fight scene in the book of course because grima worm tongue does not have a bunch of thugs that came from goodness knows where to support his i don't even understand why they're there in in the movie i i really don't because the whole theory in the movie of course is that saruman is possessing theoden's mind and therefore, Theoden actually is giving orders according to what Saruman wants. But then why does Wormtongue need a bunch of thugs to back him up when Theoden is giving orders on his own anyway? The, the movie plays out in a way that seems inconsistent. The thugs are unnecessary. Also, where'd they come from? Are these just, like, malcontents within Rohan that he found that think Saruman would be better than Theoden? That seems weird, uh, but if they're not that, if they're, you know, from outside of Rohan, the most natural thing would be, like, Dunlendings or something, but if they're Dunlendings, they're obvious enemies of Rohan, why are they there? It's like, to anybody that understands the ba basic story in the background from the books, it's like, this scene makes no sense. Why are these guys here? So, and the other thing is, like, earlier in the movie, we had a scene where Theoden was apparently incapable of even talking. Like, he just kind of sits there and looks to Grima for everything and kind of mutters under his breath. And so you get the impression early on, Grima is the one really calling the shots, and it's, you know, like his the signature that he shows Aomer for banishing him that's allegedly Theoden's looks like it was probably, you know, Grima holding his hand, making him write it or something. It was that bad. So up to that point in the movie, you might think Theoden really isn't communicating at all, and it's really just Grima doing it as if he's speaking for Theoden, but that's obviously not the case, because we do get Theoden speaking in this scene, apparently on his own. So it doesn't make any sense all of a sudden, because Wormtongue apparently has these thugs to back him up, but he doesn't need the thugs to back him up if Theoden is actually capable of speaking on Grima's behalf, backing him up with the authority of the king himself. So, that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, fight scene in, breaks out in the movie version, and of course, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are beating up all of the thugs, which is a completely unnecessary distraction from what then happens, which is Gandalf magically draws the poison of Saruman, i.e. exercises him from Theoden. And then, of course, Theoden, after the exorcism takes place magically becomes a whole lot younger in appearance. The book version actually has a lot more conversation at this point, because instead of just, you know, confronting Wormtongue openly and showing his staff and creating a crisis, we actually get a lot more back and forth in which Wormtongue ends up... Well, Gandalf mentions the fact that they're all clad in gray because they were clad by the elves in Lothlorien. Wormtongue then pipes in and says... Ah, well, he goes off on a rant about the witch in Lothlorien and how bad things happen and speaks ill generally of Lothlorien and Galadriel, which, of course, gets Gimli's, you know, hackles up, and he kind of steps forward, but Gandalf kind of puts his hand on his shoulder and 
he speaks a rhyme uh, about Lorien, which is apparently a rhyme of Rohan itself, because it refers to it as Dwimmerdine, which is a different, or Dwimmerdine, I'm not, I don't know my Anglo-Saxon pronunciation, okay, I'm going with Dwimmerdine, because that's what it looks like in American English, but I'm pretty sure that's not how it's actually pronounced, at any rate. He gives this, and then he goes on a bit more, and then he starts really kind of berating Wormtongue and criticizing him for being the one that's poisoning Theoden's mind. And at some point, he, in his discussion and talking about things that are going on, he raises his staff, and suddenly the light from the windows in, in Metaseld are is blotted out, and it's not clear why, and it's there's a sound of thunder as well. Simultaneously, the fire in the middle of the hall dies to embers, and now Griba makes a big deal about the staff, because now he's actually apparently done something with the staff. I'll come back to that. But nothing, in fact, really goes on much beyond the fact that after Grima complains of the staff, then there's a flash of light, which seems as if lightning had, you know, destroyed the roof, and next thing you know, Wormtongue is just sprawled on his face. And uh, so he's he's as much of a coward as he is in the movie, I suppose. So they got that part right anyway. And then Gandalf raises his staff again, and the window to which he seems to be pointing becomes a little bit lighter. The darkness kind of clears, and he mentions to Theoden, there is still hope, not everything is dark. He also asks Theoden to come outside because he has counsel for him, but it's not for all ears, so he wants to tell him something in private. When they come outside, and I should mention here, Eowyn is in both the movie and the book, but her role in the book is a lot more in the background, and I almost mean that literally. She's standing kind of at the back of Theoden's throne the entire time, and does very little. In the movie, of course, when the fight breaks out, and then Gandalf starts physically interacting with Theoden, trying to get him to not be possessed by Saruman, she kind of tries to intervene and Aragorn holds her back. In the book, the only real interaction we get from her at this point is when Theoden comes down to meet Gandalf and walk outside, he kind of tells her, you know, you can stay here, I'm fine, the time for fear is over. They both go outside, and the interesting thing is when they step outside, they see that there is in fact a rainstorm moving across the plain. At this point, Gandalf urges him to throw away his walking stick, which he does, and he stands up straight, and then he really is tall again, and at some point in all of this, he ends up smiling, and I can't remember exactly at what point it was. I think it was when he tells uh, Hama to go get Aomer at Gandalf's prompting. Gandalf says, do I not guess correctly that you have Aomer kept in prison? And here again is a major difference. Aomer was banished in the movie. In the book, he's just kept in prison because he had taken men from the defense of Metacel to chase after those Urukai who had Merry and Pippin. So here he broke the rule. He wasn't like abandoning anything really because it was he was trying to stop worse things. But Grima had told Theoden and, and and this is really I'll get to this more, but Grima's real whole play here is just to make Theoden afraid and passive. And so Theoden, fearing for his own safety, had basically punished Aomer for taking away some of his men to go chase these Urukai. So he's never banished. He's there, and he brings him back. And Theoden tells, not directly to Gandalf, but kind of like just as an aside, since Hamel was such a poor door ward for not taking Gandalf's staff, you know, let him be an errand boy and let the, you know, the, the I forget the term he uses, but basically the let the criminal bring the criminal to judgment. And he speaks in a stern way, but he's also got kind of a smile on his face, and when he smiles, like, a lot of the wrinkles kind of disappear and don't come back. Not magic, as it is in clearly in the movie, because in the movie it's like Gandalf purges Saruman out of his system and then he just becomes younger. Here you don't get the impression that that's magic, it's just like he, he lightens up and he stops stops thinking old, and therefore stops being old, in a sense. Anyway, Gandalf then, while he, they're waiting, tells Theoden, you know, come here, I want to tell you some stuff, and he starts whispering in his ear, 
And we don't know what the conversation is, but we know that the light in Theoden's eyes shines ever brighter. And he ends, Gandalf, by saying, there lies our hope, and he's pointing out toward the east. And so the idea we get is that he's been telling him what the quest is. He's telling him about Frodo's quest. And this is why it's not for all ears. Not everybody needs to know that. But Theoden, as king, kind of needs to know that, and he needs to understand the situation and what what's important, what's not important. So... Theoden now realizes what's going on in full, and that, you know, he ends up pardoning Eomer, of course, and that's kind of the end of the scene, and now we've got both to compare. Now, the fun thing that I, that, that's really going on, I think, is the magic aspect, but I'll handle that last. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is what I mentioned earlier about Wormtongue being, in the book, more about keeping Theoden afraid and passive, in the movie, of course, Saruman has literally, in some sense, possessed Theoden. He's taken control of his mind and body in some way. How that happens, we don't know. Why Grima is necessary in this whole thing, we don't know. We don't know anything. Did Grima have to, like, drop some magic poison in his cup for this to work? Eh, don't know. Why did Grima need to be there? Because Theoden can only talk sometimes when it's convenient for the movie plot? Don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's just kind of... There's a lot of unanswered questions. In the book, we know everything, effectively. I mean, we don't know all the details, but we know exactly what's been going on. There are several comments made. In fact, when Theoden comes out uh, with Gandalf, he says, it is not so dark here. And you get the impression, and are almost explicitly told in places, that what's been going on is Wormtongue has been filling him with lies but specifically lies about the dangers in the world and how, you know, you need to just hunker down, keep yourself safe, you know, don't meddle in the outside world, you're fine, which is a great preparation because Saruman is over there doing his thing and about to just completely run over Rohan with his Urukai army. And if Theoden is an active king worrying about the well-being of his people, but not just his people, but kind of the world at large, then that doesn't come off as well, because Saruman isn't going to be able to be free of meddling. It's not going to be quite so simple. And Gandalf even kind of mentions something along those lines when he talks about Eomer, and he's like, if Eomer hadn't run after those uruk we'd be in a lot worse position than we are now. There's a lot that goes on that's not really explicit, but this is pretty clearly the impression you get from reading the book. This is what Wormtongue has been doing this whole time. He's been filling Theoden's ear with lies, but also honey. And it's kind of like, you know, filling him with the idea that you're fine as long as you sit here, do nothing, and be safe. And that's kind of it. Totally different from his role in the movie, whatever that role may be. Um, now, they both do have, you know, Warm Tongue in both the book and movie have probably the same exact motive, which involves Eowyn, which I don't want to get into too much, but, you know, whatever the motive is, it's not really clear what Warm Tongue's purpose is in the movie, because it doesn't seem like he's necessary if Saruman is controlling Theoden. On the other hand, why does... I, it's just, it's kind of weird. I don't understand it. In the book, it's really clear why he's necessary. Saruman can't just control Theoden. That's not a thing in the book. That's, there's nothing in any of the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit, or the Silmarillion, or anything that implies that you can magically control other people, other than by kind of trapping them the way Sar Sauron did with the Rings of Power. That is a mechanism by which you can gain control other, over other people. You can't just magic people's brains into doing what you want, by any means, as far as we can tell. So, what exactly is going on in the movie, how we're supposed to understand that, not clear. Book version, very clear. It's subtle, but if you pay attention, you definitely understand what's going on. The other thing here, and this is why I connect, I'm doing this particular video right now, after those two previous videos I did on magic... This scene apparently has a lot of magic going on in both the book and the movie. In the movie, it's obvious, because Saruman is controlling Theoden magically somehow. Gandalf purges him out of Theoden's system magically somehow. Not really exactly sure how that's supposed to work. It's a movie. They're doing magic. 
it's a soft magic system, whatever. In the book, we seem to have a lot of magic going on, but it's not clear that there actually is any. And I say that because when Gandalf raises his staff the first time, it gets dark and we hear the roll of thunder. But when we go outside, we see there actually is a rainstorm. And so that thunder and that darkness, those were real. I don't think Gandalf conjured a storm out of thin air. Uh, why would he? And it even says in the book, the storm that had come from the east was now just sweeping over the plains. There was actually a storm coming, and it was just, it just passed. Now, did Gandalf have maybe a little bit of supernatural aid from, say, Manwe in controlling the wind and the way that that storm moved? Possibly. But Gandalf, I don't think, has any real say in what happens with the weather. I don't think that's the kind of thing that he can do in the form that he is in. He is associated with Manwe as, an, as a Maya, but that doesn't mean he has control over weather systems in his immediate area. Does he have a really good knowledge of what's going on in the weather? Yes. Probably. Maybe. Unclear. But if he does, that would explain a lot, because it explains when he does his thing, he's doing that out of theatrics. He knows when it's going to get dark, and he knows when it's going to get light, and so he is using that to make it seem as if his actions are connected with the world. But more importantly, he's doing it for the literal dramatic effect. When he raises his staff and it goes dark, he is making a dramatic point. When he raises his staff again and it lightens up, he is also making a point. And the points that he's making are more vividly conveyed to the audience, namely Theoden, precisely because of the external events which seem magically to match up with what he's doing with his staff. Which may actually just be a you know, a prop for old age, for all we know. It's not really clear. Very rarely do we see any magic being done specifically with the staff, and when we do, it's Gandalf the Grey, not Gandalf the White. One example would be when he creates fire on Karathras, and he just sticks his, well, he st puts his staff into a bundle of sticks and makes it light up. The next time we clearly see magic from Gandalf after he turns white is when he holds up his hand and a shaft of light comes out and scares away the Nazgul at Minas Tirith. That's the next time we see him clearly using magic as Gandalf the White. And he's using his hand, not his staff. That's important. Now, is the staff important before he's Gandalf the White? Maybe. It may be more of a focusing tool than a necessary implement, not really clear, and certainly the staff has very important symbolism, if nothing else, because he breaks Saruman's staff at Isengard when he casts him from the Order. So I'm not saying the staff is meaningless, there's definitely meaning to it, but I don't think he's actually doing magic with his staff in this scene. The only really questionable element in the scene in the book that might be magic is the fire dying down to embers. And this is important because Gandalf's primary magic attribute seems to be fire. He does fireworks. He starts a fire on a mountain. He starts fires when he's fighting wolves. He starts fires all the time. It's what he does. And he has the ring of fire, Narya. So there's a lot of things about Gandalf's character and who he is magically that are tied very strongly to fire. So when the fire burns down to embers, that's our strongest cue that there might be something magical going on. Even here, though, it's not necessarily magic, because if there is a thunderstorm going on outside, there's probably also some wind and some atmospheric changes, and those could also make a fire that is already relatively low burn even lower. So it's possible even this is just a natural effect of what's going on outside the building because there's open windows in, in the roof to let the smoke out and fresh air in and therefore atmospheric pressure is going to affect what goes on in that building, which includes the fire. Now, if there is magic going on, again, this doesn't necessarily have to be connected to his staff. It could just be him 
doing it because if he can make a shaft of white light come out of his hand, what else might he be able to do without his staff? The staff, though, again, is a very... I mentioned before it's a prop for age. That's the way it's termed in the book. That term prop is very important here because mentioned before about the dramatic effect of what Gandalf is doing. A lot of what he's doing is drama. It is explicitly, almost explicitly dramatic. Um, and it's very intentionally dramatic, I think. And the fact that he has the staff adds to that. If he just raised his hand and there was, you know, the thing, you know, the darkness or the light or whatever was, which whichever time you want to look at, that's impressive. If you do it with the staff, and you're known to be a wizard who carries the staff around all the time, that's a little more impressive, because now it really looks more like magic, and more like something that you're saying as a powerful being. So, that staff is a prop in more than one sense. And so, even if the magic isn't being done through the staff, the staff adds to the dramatic effect, if nothing else. But again, I don't think we even have to assume that the dying of the fire down to embers is even connected to the actual staff or any kind of magic at all. I think we can probably safely assume it's just like everything else that happens. It's, I don't want to say random or chance, because there's too many coincidences in the way the events play out in this scene for it to be truly coincidental. That, that's too much. Clearly, though, either Gandalf is operating with a very, very enhanced knowledge of what's going on, or he's acting with some, you know, supernatural intervention by the Valar or even Eru Iluvatar on his behalf to make the whole thing play out right. Either way, it's not chance, but it's apparent chance in the service of a message. And that message is ultimately the curing that Gandalf does in this episode. The the episode in the movie, of course, it's literally like a magic cure casting Saruman's hold over Theoden off, however that works. In the book, his cure is again tied very much to the ring of Narya, just encouraging Theoden. That's really all it is. And that ties to the ring Narya because when Círdan gives Gandalf the ring when Gandalf first arrives in Middle-earth. He says, with it you may be able to kindle anew, you know, hearts to courage, you know, that have long since become, you know, died down. And so what Gandalf is doing here, he is using that ring probably, but it's not to do magic. It's to enhance his own ability to encourage and enhearten Theoden to no longer be fearful. And to, you know, to, to stand up, be his own man again, and to go out there and do what he needs to do. And that's why this scene is so fascinating in the book. Because of the way it's done, everything kind of plays into that theme. Whereas in the movie, the movie is fine as far as it goes. But it's like any movie adaptation of a really long written work. It's going to have to leave out so much subtlety and nuance that you just... It's no longer nearly as interesting or impressive as it would be if you just read the book version because they have to be a lot more blunt. You know, they have a lot more blunt instruments at their disposal, and it's partially just because of time. They don't have the time to develop all of that really cool stuff that when you pay attention, you're like, oh, I see what they did there. You know, it's not nearly that interesting in the movie. It's interesting in a different way because now you're using magic, and if you're a Dungeons & Dragons fan, that's cool just because it's cool. But it's not, it's not the same kind of cool as what really goes on in this scene in Tolkien's version. So, that is my rundown and comparison of the scene where Gandalf and the Three Hunters confront Theoden at Metaseld, book versus movie. Whose version do you think is better? Do you think that I left out any major details that are really important that would have furthered this discussion some more? Leave your comments in the comments below because there's probably more to this than even I covered, but it's it's a deep, deep well that can be drawn from many, many times for many different purposes. So if you did like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it around. Please also subscribe and hit the notification bell if you want to catch more of my content. I also have podcast versions, and I'm on Rumble and Odyssey. 
You can follow me on Twitter at JRRTLore for some occasional Tolkien-related trivia questions, and you can support me over at Patreon. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namariye.